Good morning. I'm Paul Morrissey and I'm representing the TM Forum here today. I'll be talking about digital innovation and how you can monetize content through that methodology. I'm going to speak today about innovation and it's really about innovation in telco but it, this can be innovation in any business. So let's give you a bit of history about me because I think that will put this in focus. Um, I think I'm probably the oldest person in the room <laughs> by far. So I was part of the team that put the first digital telephone exchange in the UK. So that, that shows you how old I am. Uh, and I, be, I was in telco for, a, well, I am still in telco for a long, long time. Uh, I go back, sort of the history of telco is around me from, from where we started to be digital. I worked abroad for a long time, came back to the UK, started a series of companies, and I was lucky enough in 2008 to have the first company, I think, compulsory purchased by the MOD because we'd invented an encryption technology that they didn't want anybody else to have. So I, uh, I, did, I was compulsory purchased for quite a, quite a sizable sum of money. Uh, at that point, I thought, the Mediterranean yacht? Maybe not. And, and really, because I, I wanted to be involved in this industry, and this industry really drives me. I'm passionate about it. So what I did was, and this is where these three things come from, I went to the university and I said to them, I've got money I want to invest in good ideas coming out of this university. That was in Liverpool, John Moores. It's now in many universities. I went to TM Forum and I said to them, all these, all these businesses that are coming out of the universities, actually, I'm getting in the way of these guys. I need to get out the way. I need something else to do. So TM Forum said, kindly said to me, come and help us to be the ambassador for big data analytics, innovation, <clears throat> and customer centricity. So I actually act in that role for TM Forum. I, I look at the, over the global specifications, the guidebooks, and, and what's put out by all the, the industry. Does everybody know the TM Forum? Good. Well, look, at, I know you do. <laughs> she works for the TM Forum. <laughs> so I've got to be careful what I say here. Uh, so uh, if you don't, please go and look them up. And the other thing, the bottom one, is the chairman of Livewire Capital Partners, and that's the, the organization where I first put my money in, and now we've got lots and lots of other investors who invest in new startup companies. And those new startup companies are all driving through innovation. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that works later on. Okay, and I'm gonna go today, if I get time to go right through this, I know we've got 20 minutes. So why you would innovate, how to innovate, what to innovate, and who to innovate with. And they might, might sound like uh, the sort of questions that everybody would ask when you were innovating, but nobody does. So why should you innovate? I think that this, this slide, if you can read it from the back, basically is saying that if you don't, you're gonna be left behind and the economy, the, the customer economy and the, tr the telco economy and the whole of the economy is gonna move on without you. The second part of that slide is if you don't try and counter this by doing innovation yourself, and there's different ways of doing innovation yourself, then nobody's gonna wait for you. So what does that mean in reality? Well, look at this. In the USA alone, 52%, that's 50, that's more than half of the companies who are in the Fortune 100 have had a, what I call a catastrophic event. They've either gone through a merger, they've gone through, through an acquisition, or they've gone bankrupt. 52% of the Fortune 100 companies. Most of the telcos in this room would be in that, in that, that category. And the second one's even worse that if you were a company in 1900, in the, in the top Fortune 500, and the, the only reason this is, these are US stats, by the way, is we haven't got this data for the UK. And that's why it's based on US stats. So your life expectancy was 60 years. By 2020, the life expectancy of new companies starting up is gonna be 12 years. Now that puts a whole new spin on shareholder value, on, on uh, the senior management team, but that's what's happening. We're moving towards the, the, the way the companies operate completely differently. So let's just look at a few of these. And I, I know you've all had these examples. You've all bunch of shows that you've really seen the likes of Alibaba not doing any, they don't have any stock. Google don't own any content. They do now, they didn't used to. They are bringing content into their play. Airbnb, the world's biggest. And I was amazed at this. They've got more hotel rooms than anybody else in the world. And so they're valued at the big, as, as the biggest accommodation provider in the world. And we all know about Uber. 
and I'm getting one later. <laughs> and probably for nothing, because I've given it to. But they, they've all basically disrupted traditional industries. And telco is a traditional industry. And it's, it's, we're actually seeing the disruption. We're seeing these OTT players coming over the top of us. We are actually seeing people who are looking at a space and saying, I can move into that space. There's a famous Liverpool football manager called Bill Shankly, who actually, somebody else, <laughs> who, 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 one of his, his great sayings to his players was, find a space and move into it and the ball will find you. And that's what these people are doing. They're finding spaces inside industries where people are not playing or traditionally it's difficult for them to play. All of these companies were built to scale. They didn't happen, you know, incidentally, they were deliberately built to scale. And they've all been valued at over a billion dollars. Those lot, there's a lot more. They're called unicorns on the U US stock market. So, but innovation doesn't only happen outside of your company. There are a lot of companies who are actually driving innovation, successful innovation, lots of companies who are driving non-successful innovation, but some are driving innovation inside their companies. And these are just some examples. But it's not easy. It's not easy to do this. And that's, that's really what I'm going to try and go on to next. How would you do this and how does it happen? Well, all of those companies, including those, actually start off with where do I want to be? They have a massive transformational process. They're thinking, where do I need to be to stay in this market? They've got think tanks inside their organizations thinking, how are people attacking me? Google have got a whole set of people who actually are looking how to disrupt their model all the time. That's their day job. How do I disrupt the model of the company? So these massive, tra I'm not going to go through this too far, but if you want to do some reading on this, I'll, I'll give you some um, stuff later on. But they're all set up. They all have in external attributes. They call on staff on demand. They don't, employ pe they don't employ a lot of people. If they want something doing, they just go out to the market and say, I want that, Mechanical Turk, or uh, you know, somewhere where they can actually go and get people. Did you say you were with Procter & Gamble? Procter & Gamble use a, a, an app in the US called GigWalk. Have you heard of that? So they've got uh, GigWalk, have got about 2,000 people in the US that go around and just look where stock is on shelves. They don't trust the fact that Walmart say it's on shelf three and everybody looks at it. They just walk around daily and put a report back. They pay those people $10 an hour. So you know, th th that staff on demand, well, they want something doing, get out there and find it. It's there. They use the community and the crowd. I, I'm not going to go through these examples. We haven't got time. But if you want to talk about it later, I'll show you how these work. And they also have internal attributes. They have tremendous interfaces. They have dashboards people can actually look at and appreciate. And they allow, let's move on to this, they allow inside their organizations experimentation. They allow people the space to experiment and they give them the autonomy to work in that space. And they, amazingly, I think, I don't know what the organizations here, none of them, absolutely none of them have got an intranet. They all use social media tools inside their organization to communicate. So, how to start with an innovation program? Innovation can only be successful, uh, in my opinion, from the top down. You've got to get C-level, or even some of the things people I'm dealing with now are shareholders, shareholders to understand how innovation can change their business. But that's not enough. You have to capture the innovation from inside, uh, from the bottom up, as well as the top down. Um, these are three examples. I don't know whether I've got time to go into them, but I, I th these are three companies that we've set up, that I've set up, that actually have worked. I'll give you the first one, Don't Worry About Me, is, is actually an independent film company. It's a film, that. And when we started that film, there were 25 people on it. We had 200,000 pounds to finish the film. Uh, we've got a, we actually got a film company that did it, which is uh, I've got with my brother, David Morrissey. I don't know if you know him in The Walking Dead and that sort of thing. So. He wanted to make a film. What we did was we got 20 people around, said we've got eight weeks to film this, to script it, to film it, and to get it in the can. And the first meeting, we went to the first meeting, 20 people sat around the table, and I said to one of them, right, it's, you know, it's, it's a two-hander. There's a boy and a girl and Liverpool. That's basically it. So I, I went in. I didn't know who anybody was, and I said to this one, one lady, right, I said, you're Nora, who was the, the lead. She said, no, 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 I'm, I'm a makeup." 
I said, no, no, just stay with me. You're not. And I said to somebody else, right, you're James. And he was the, he was the male lead. And he said, no, oh, I'm the boom operator. So I said, just stick with that. So we started trying to craft the story around two people and a place. Because if you're 150,000, we're not going to make Spartacus. Well, we might have done, but it, <laughs> it wouldn't be very good. So the, 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 they started trying to weave a story. We had three weeks to weave a story together. Uh, at the end of the first day, we'd got the basic outline, boy meets girl, you know, something happens, la di da and I'm not going to give the, the film away, and I've got them over here, £7.99. But <laughs> no, I'm not going to give it away. But at the end of the day, I said, right, we've got the basis of this story now, and I said to, these, you know, to Nora and James, go and make a Facebook page of your character. And I said, everybody else in the room, attach yourself to that Facebook page and start putting ideas out about this script. The script now is these two people's lives. They're meeting each other. There's things going on. At the end of the three weeks, we had 60,000 people following this. And I then said, right, to my brother David, I said to him, right, at the end of each day when we're filming, you are going to do a YouTube video of what we did. So at the end of that time, the next three weeks, we had 130,000 people. And I said to them, all sent them a message said thanks very much you're all going to be on the credits of the film it's like those little shared things with little names on it and you can have it for a pound we ended up making before the film was even released we'd made 120,000 pounds or we'd, we'd had 120,000 pounds pledged so that was a way of bringing this community into play into developing the script and we've done that in, in many other ones we're doing it with an american television series now where What's happening is the American television series is based on a comic book character, and the comic book character is finished. In other words, we've got to the end of where the comic books were, and we want to know that the audience still wants to follow. What do they want to go next? What's the next story? So we go out to the whole audience, and we use this in gaming. We'll put a gaming app there, to your point, and people play the game, and we see where those, where those games go, and that actually informs the content. So this is audience participated content very important and so let, let's go back into where we were so in the in any organization now you really need to know how the organization what's the appetite in the organization to innovate and that that's key we need to understand whether you're mature enough to actually be an innovation organization and we need to enable a model for the culture and trans transformational change. We've got to enable this model. And this is where we start with the business. Your business that you're doing now, you need to continue to do that. Because that's bringing the pennies in. But you also need to know where the business of the future is. And I call those businesses that can do that, that have got the maturity to do that, ambidextrous organizations. They can look backwards, and they can also look forwards. But the, the participants in the looking forwards really need to be differentiated and dissolved from business as usual. Lots of innovation programs which are inside organizations get slowed down, killed, or even de derailed because somebody says, look, you can't do that today. We've got a problem over here. And that's where most innovation dies in organizations. The ideas are there, but the actual execution isn't. So from a revolutionary point of view, what we're pu putting forward now, what I'm putting forward now is that the organization needs to actually look at ideas that are coming out and invest in those ideas. Because most people who have got these new ideas are actually following them on your money. You're paying for them, and they're, and they're going to go out to a VC afterwards and say, can you put money into my, my new idea? So capturing those people to have those ideas inside your organization is, is really the way forward that I'm pushing now. Now, that means that the organizations have got a, a different agenda. They've got another revenue stream. Some of those ideas may have nothing to do with telecommunications. Nothing to do with it. Some of them might. Some of them may be efficiency savings, and you can bring them back in. But the most important thing when we're doing this, and we're doing it with quite a few health organizations now, two hospitals in the north of England are participating in this, and we've got two banks that are participating in it. And those individuals... I mean, I'll close your ears now. Those individuals are given equity in their ideas. So those ideas are put into a company. They form the company because if they don't, 
those people are not going to give you those ideas. They're not going to have any trust about you as their employer doing that. So that has a whole new spin on the way this works. <clears throat> but these are the people you need. You need the visionaries, and that's really the, either the shareholders or the, or the C-suite. You need the preneurs. And I use that word <laughs> over and over again. Because in my book, there are three types of preneurs. There's those entrepreneurs we all know about. There's the entrepreneurs, which are these people inside these organizations. And the last lot are the older preneurs, the people who you're just about to get rid of, the people you've on your redundancy list, the people who take early redundancy. Just think about early redundancy. When you put an early redundancy package out there, who goes? You've got very little control about who goes, but you're losing a huge amount of knowledge of your business. And those people actually, in, in some of the, uh, the hospitals we're dealing with, have come up with some of the better ideas and actually are participating in them as part of their redundancy package. We'll put you into what we call, I'll talk about it later, an innovation factory. And an innovation factory is not inside your organization. It's outside your organization. It's somewhere where these ideas are explored and experimented and failed early. You must fail these early because if you don't, you have waste going through. Same as anything we do in product development. How many products do we put out there? I was very pleased to hear that Telefonica killed some products because they weren't working. That's really what we need to be doing. We want to eliminate waste from this new development, these new in, in, uh, innovations that are coming out. So I think that the, the way that we need to do that is, as I said, put it outside of the organization, almost innovation as a service. So what we've developed is what's called an innovation factory. You drop ideas in, you go through various stages of examining them, and the first uh, um, stage is effectively validation of the idea. If you can't validate the idea, don't follow it. And the people that validate it are your customers. If nobody's going to buy it, then it's not worth pursuing. So we do that by using sort of lean canvas methodologies. We go through that lean canvas. And what we do now is actually when an idea comes to a point where we think it's worth pursuing, we'll actually co-invest with the company. So we're co-investing with the hospital. The, the, you know, the app may cost, and it's a digital innovation, so most of them are, are apps, but the app may cost 30,000 to get to MVP. What does the company provide? The company provides the individual. The innovation factory provides the people who actually can develop that, and also co-invests. And the, in, the individual really has an equity investment in this. And so I think that that's a, a, a bit of a revolutionary way. There are other ways of people that are innovating. A lot of people are innovating inside their organization, as I said, but they get distracted. A lot of people are actually saying, we will have a university to do some research. A lot of people are putting in what they call innovation hubs, where they have people in tech areas that are looking at next products. And I've got some slides on how that happens, but these are the people that you need in your organization, and everybody, bottom up and top down, needs to be involved in this to make it work. I've got no idea what the next slide is, so. Oh, so we have got some assets that we can use, obviously, especially if we're going to start doing this. One of the things I do for TM Forum is customer centricity and big data analytics. So we've got a huge amount of data. And if we go to other industries and actually merge them together, mash these data sets together, we've got even more uh, data. Recently, I think probably a lot of people know that Orange have, have just bought a bank. So they're going to have two sets of customers. Going to have a set of customers who are thinking about their bank and another set of companies that are thinking about their telco. In North America, and TELUS have just bought a healthcare company. So thinking about that customer base, we're expanding the customer base now, but we're making more, to your point, we're making more complex the interface with the customer. Because we're now saying to the customer, we can do a lot more. So uh, my view, this is going to move into an AI space. AI is going to make a, have a big contribution to this space, and AI actually surfacing a knowledge base behind it. And in TM Forum, we do these things called catalysts. And if you go on the website, you can see a catalyst we did on this last year. It's, a, it, it's about customer interaction in, in what I'm calling the interaction center, not the call center. So what's on next? Okay, it's got... A, D digitization is across the whole of a business. It doesn't matter where you are in the business. You can be in HR, you can be in maintenance, you can be in manufacturing. I'll tell you a, a quick story about one of the hospitals. We had a hackathon about eight months ago, 
to come up with a hundred ideas that we wanted to examine against this this portfolio, if you like, this canvas. And we had some fantastic ideas, you know, sort of consultant surgeons coming in saying, I, I want an app that works works out people's heights if they're in wheelchairs. So if I take a picture of them and work out how, how big the, the, you know, the, this bone is, can I then extrapolate to work out the height of the person? And we said, oh, that's a great idea. That, right? you know, how much do you think the app's going to cost? You know, quick sort of back of the back bucket, as you said, about £100,000. One of the people in the audience said, why don't we just ask them? <laughs> Most people know how tall they are. <laughs> idea died. But the one that won was really interesting because we had all these apps about asthma and you know defibrillation and you know social tendencies and minds and all this sort of some fantastic ideas. The one that won was actually the cleaner. It was a brand new hospitalist in Liverpool. The cleaner said, "I think we should have a one-way system around this hospital because I keep bumping into people when I'm doing the cleaning." And we did an analysis, and it didn't. It wasn't a digital app, but we actually put a one-way system in, and the hospital's efficiency went up eight percent. Great idea, very simple. But the, the actual amount of work that the, the people were, were looking at doing, so you know, the work that they ticked off in their boxes that they were doing in, in you know, we looked at different, di yeah, in X amount of time, yeah. So yeah, maybe that's not a fantastic KPI, but it was enough for us to say we w we think that's a good idea and we'd invest in it, and, and we did invest in it. So it's you know, it's actually looking at how that works, and and by the way, I, I don't believe in KPIs. I mean. <laughs> I really look at what are called OKRs, and they're objectives and key results against the objectives. And I think that's what you've got to do in this. And in this innovation society, we have various stages of how we measure innovation, because you're never going to get innovation past your CFO. You are never going to get it, because you fail too many of them. And he just wants to see the bottom line, or she wants to see the bottom line. So we, we changed the whole of that arrangement, and we said, okay, well, what we do is have we, we can have some innovation accounting rules. And we can have customer validation as an innovation accounting rule. And th we, we really changed the terminology of how in innovation was working inside an organization. So where are we next? Uh, he's, I'm going. Scalar data is very big. Um, I think you all know that. I'm, I, I just want to do one here. Right. So, food for thought, and you, you're all going to get this, but this last one is, is really interesting. How long is a zeta second? Now, this was a question my daughter asked me. Well, she didn't ask me. She said, what the hell do you do, Dad? And she's an artist. And I said, well, a few things, <laughs> but a few balls in the air. And she said, well, you know, this data thing, how's that work? And I said, well, you've got a, a you're going to go calculate on your PC now. Stop doing that. <laughs> You've got a PC, I said, and when you put a, a painting on that PC, it takes up quite a few, you know, a few megabytes of your painting, and you put it out there, and it, it's shown to people. I said, but, you know, your PC's got 500 uh, meg on it. She's always asking me for a terabyte, but I'm not going to do that. But I said, it's got 500 meg, and it gets filled up quite quickly. I said, but just think if every one of those bits in the megabyte was a second. Now, we're working in terms of big data now, and we're going to have 76.5 oh, zettabytes of data being created in the world by 220. Now, that's 76 followed by 21 zeros. It's a big number. And if you turn that into a second, a zeta second is, in fact, 4.6 times the length of the universe that's been since the Big Bang. So this is a big number. And you know, controversially, when you go to the, um, the storage manufacturers, they'll tell you we haven't got enough storage to store all this stuff. So at some point, we've got to start throwing this away. And that's another lecture on Zeta Seconds, and this, sorry, on the data equity and a half-life of data and how useful it is. But anyway, that, that's about all the time I've got. I could go on for another five hours. <laughs> but thanks very much. And any questions, we'll, we'll do afterwards.